thinking about John Chrysostom, the silver-mouthed or silver-tongued. Apparently his sermon's got a round of applause at the end, so it's an act of faith on your part to have a round of applause at the beginning. Thank you so much. Um, I'm not here really with my Barnabas, hat, Barnabas Aid hat on, but it would be remiss of me to say uh, that in the room next door we've got lots and lots of free literature, which really gives you the, <coughs> the uh, depth and the breadth of the work that we do uh, in pretty much every continent now. Not every country, but at least up to 60 countries or 190 was the last count. And we just opened an office in um, Sao Paulo in Brazil because Brazil will be a very important breadbasket for the whole of that continent. And so <coughs> our work amongst persecuted Christians or suffering Christians still goes on, if you want to know about that. <coughs> but more importantly, if you want the family to be part of your family, then grab this magazine. And uh, grab this little one as well because our little prayer diary will help you to be uh, a part of their lives and them to be a part of your life, more importantly. I have found, I know you're all incredibly disciplined in your prayers, but I find that something that reminds me daily to, to face up to realities of projects or people uh, and makes me pray for them is a good discipline indeed. It's our 30th anniversary. So we've published a magazine, which also is free. So please, after your tea and coffees, please take those. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, read from Acts chapter 12, ver first 17 verses. I'm from the ESV uh, today. And um, the last time I was here, I spoke on from Romans 5, I think, first five verses. And also embarrassed to not nearly remember Kirsty's name. This is terrible. Uh, but all, what that does is it just tells you I'm getting older. That's what it tells you. It's not not that you're any less important or that sort of thing. So it's really lovely to have the reminder, actually, of one of the tremendous things that happened um, to you uh, whilst we were here and God at work, despite us, I think, really, despite us. Acts chapter 12. And the first 17 verses says this. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak round you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gates leading to the city. It opened them for them by itself and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. 
When she recognised Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the other brothers and sisters about this, he said. And then he left for another place. Now, for a couple of years, I've been wandering around uh, various churches across the theological and denominational spectrum and um, just wondering how they're carrying on or, or coping uh, post-COVID and post-other things. But it's also uh, helped me to reflect a little bit more on mission uh, because Barnabas would be part of world mission, I suppose. Uh, and uh, I've called this talk uh, Some Mission Principles. And uh, the reason I call them principles is because, uh, please don't ask me to do this, but if you were to ask me to prove that this, these principles were repeated across scripture, then I would have to show you that that was indeed the case. Uh, for me, a principle is something that's, oh, there's that happening again. And there it is in that passage. And there it is again. So I think that I could, if asked to, um, show that these principles are important because they reflect pretty much themselves all the way through scripture. And I think one of the first things I want to say is that it's important to have a large or big picture view to force you to think about the detail. Once you've got the larger picture, that helps you with the detail. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, uh, when I caught COVID uh, last year in Pusey, by the way, you can give me a five-minute warning, can you? That will keep me disciplined. So that will, I'm looking at about half past, I think. <coughs> yes. Um, I caught COVID May 2019, I think, I think it was there, thereabouts. Uh, and I was in Pusey, and, and that's the quintessential English countryside. You're looking actually one of the white horses that's on a hillside around um, various counties, and that's one of them. And I thought, well, what a fantastic view this is. And here's me recovering from COVID. And uh, I have the great pleasure of wandering um, the, the beautiful countryside of England. But wouldn't it be even better to be this guy as he wandered the past? And I thought I'd have an even better view and an even uh, larger, broader vista. And what I'm going to say is that both God and his word give us this vista. It, it gives us a position where we stand outside ourselves and are able to see things the way God sees things. Why is that important? Because it means that if I'm conforming uh, my life and changing it so that I'm doing the things that God is doing, then I'm actually co-working with God, God working through me. And most of us will realise that in our Christian experience, that is the most productive way of living the Christian experience is allowing God's life to work itself through you. Um, and that's the reason why all the glory goes to him. So if I were to say from this passage, what's God's plan overall? Well, the writer Luke tells me that through this remarkable incident that we've just read about, the point of it all, the point of the uh, unusual, miraculous things that have gone on, and the terrible and tragic, is verse 24. And verse 24 tells us, but the word of God continued to spread and flourish, because the writer is trying to say to us, you see, it was in God's mind that working through these particular set of circumstances, that the word of God should flourish. That's what's important to God. And so if I know that that's important to God, then I begin to change my life to make the things that are important to God important to me. And um, this is my first principle then. It's the principle of God's inexorable plan. What does that mean? Is that God's plan will not be thwarted. When he reveals stuff to us or promises things to us, and they are either from his word or confirmed by God's spirit in his words, they will happen. 
based on the character of God himself. It rests on his word. And the whole of the Christian experience is learning to trust God that his will and ways which have been revealed will happen. And my job is to get involved so that I'm along the same trajectory or the same direction that God is going. So, for example, um, it would be easy to show this across scripture. Uh, for example, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, we are told in a sort of way, in a cryptic way, that the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head. Uh, but the <coughs> serpent's head will uh, sting the heel of that seed. What is all that about? Well, we begin to realize as we read through scripture, that's the first kind of mention uh, which is often referred to in circles as the proto-evangelium. What does this mean? The first mention of the good news. I've told you the plan, well, well, well beforehand, that there will be c come a time in, in, in history when my son, the seed of Abraham, the seed of, of Adam, will crush the serpent's head. And it's going to happen. And it'll happen at a cost, of course. But it will happen. And one could spend a lot of time, which I won't, because I don't have the time, to say that right across Scripture, one can prove that when God reveals things, there are real plans. You know, we don't live our Christian life in a vacuum. God talks to us. He reveals things. Not everything, but the things that we really need to know. So at the time when God's Spirit was, was actually fed up, with wrestling with, with human beings and said, I've had enough. Noah, I found someone I can trust. Will you build an ark, please? Why? Well, that doesn't matter, but I'll give you the dimensions. I, I've got a plan and I want to rescue the righteous and I want to destroy everything that has breath in it because I want this, what you're doing, to point out what's actually important to me. You see, humanity had reached a point where every possible thought and intention of the heart was towards evil, everything. And God couldn't find anyone apart from Noah and his family who came along for the ride to rescue. And so he entrusted this very important plan to demonstrate two things. The incredible patience of God. But actually that that patience could be exhausted. And that there would be a time where he would step in with destruction. But you notice that where the actual rainbow comes from afterwards is about God resisting how he's going to react to this sinful, rebellious world. He reboots the world. I'll give you another chance. There's millions of chances with God, but I know that they're going to fail again. And so you know what I'm going to do? I promise you. I promise you. I'm never, I'll never do this again. Even though you may reach the point where you exhaust my patience, and I should do. Or he tells someone to build a, a tabernacle, Moses. But give me a tent, will you? Here's the description. Here are the materials. This is to be the height of that little piece of furniture. Why? Because this is a picture of what heaven is going to be like and a place where God dwells. Will you follow it very, very closely? Because people are beginning to get an idea of what I'm revealing to them, what it's like for God to dwell amongst his people. A very, very important, valuable place where God himself somehow can dwell amongst his people. And the same for Solomon's temple. So I've spent enough time on that one to say this, that God's plans are very, very important and his promises will be fulfilled, which br brings me to my, um, my favourite proverb which is, no wisdom, no understanding, no counsel can avail against the Lord. Now, if you believe that, if you really believe that, that even the worst nightmare, bad hair day, is, is, is going to be trivial, because you will believe that if you are following God's ways, that this is just simply part of what's going on. His will will work its way out. Peter had preached, repent therefore and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time of restoring 
all the things about which God spoke. He gives big picture. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 10, God reveals his absolute intention in a broad way. It is to bring everything under the headship of Christ. That is what God is working at in my life and yours, in society and everything that he has made. That is his intention. That is God's tra tra trajectory. And therefore I can say, okay, how can my life now conform to that trajectory and intention? What is it that has to change in my life so that everything can come under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ? And at that point, you're working with God. At that point. Or ask a difficult question, which might be, am I working against that? Have I fallen short of that? Or I'm actually working with God. And so if you were to um, think of this principle again, the psalmist would say, for not from the east or from the west and not from the wilderness comes lifting up, but it is God who executes judgment, putting down one and lifting up another. Which is why I can just about cope with the idea of thinking about the coronation that happened yesterday. If it were left to my own devices, I would probably not necessarily slit my throat, but what a terrible thing has happened. I remember when the Queen died, the first um, uh, verse that came to my mind was, in the year Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. And what followed Uzziah was Ahaz, and then Manasseh. And there's a terrible time, I think. There's a judgment working its way out in my own beloved country, even as we speak. Nevertheless, God is working out his inexorable plan and it is not going to be thwarted. And one could use the book of Acts to show the same thing, that my plan is that you'll be my witnesses, my Holy Spirit will come upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, to the ends of the earth. And all the way through Acts, you will see that that plan is working itself out. Even if it causes God to spread his people around by persecution in Acts chapter 8 verse 1. They hadn't moved beyond Judea and Samaria. And so God says, yeah, you won't be, you won't, we won't like this, but part of my plan is now to allow you to be persecuted so that you may spread my word further afield. Which is what my plan was, if you'd only listened to it and responded to it. So God's inexorable plan is very, very important. First to find out, first on a broad scale, and then to work out the detail in your own lives. Let me ask you a question that I've been asking a lot of the churches post-COVID. If you were to write a history of the progress of the gospel in St. Stephen's over the last two years, what would that history look like? Would it be like some churches that have been distracted from the focus, even by a pandemic? Would it be like some churches who have deviated from being faithful even by our cultural agenda and various other agendas? Would it be like some churches across the globe who, ha who will suffer direct and overt destruction? There are places now in Iraq where Christians are going back, Armenian Christians, and that at least two million of them have been displaced. And you're looking at the end of the church which started in the fourth century being in and around places of Iraq. It is the end for them. Is that our story? I hope not. I hope our story is that God's inexorable plan is that you will be witnesses from this place and well beyond. I love the history of your going global. Please stay that way. The second principle, which I'll go through a lot quicker and then really accelerate for the last one, is that of insatiable and incessant prayer. You'll notice that when Peter is taken, when Herod, uh, uh, Agrippa, grandson of Herod the Great, there's a misnomer if ever there was one, uh, <coughs> uh, his son wanted to please the Jews and said, oh, this is marvellous. What a great witness it would be to the Jews to get on their side, to wipe out those people who are calling themselves Christians, Acts chapter 11, verse 25, 26. They're even beginning to make waves across the empire. I don't like them. They are a power threat. 
Let's wipe them out. And as part of the birthday celebration, as it were, let's put one to the sword. Now, wasn't that fun? Let's get another one along called Peter. He's one of those ones, isn't he? Because we'll, we'll highlight the ceremony with his death as well. But, but, God had different ideas. You see, it, the principle of this insatiable and incessant prayer is simply this. And I don't want to put the guilt trip on you because we all know that we should all be praying more always. So I, I'll just not labour that. Apart from saying this, I don't know if you've seen Schindler's List, one of, one of the most moving films ever in my mind. And uh, as I walked out of Schindler's List, at a totally secular audience, a couple of 300 people, they walked out at the end of that film in silence. I've never seen that before. Such a dramatic film. But Oscar Schindler, there's a, there's a point in the film where he, uh, Liam Neeson says, I, I wish I could have done more. I wish I could have saved more. I could have sacrificed more. I could have, lives could have been saved. You can see the tears running down his eyes. It's helpless. And most of us will be like that at the end of our lives. I wish I could have prayed more. I wish I could have exhibited courage more. I wish I could have been faithful more. And so this is just simply uh, is what the New Testament does, particularly at the beginning of Paul's epistles, was saying, you're doing really well, but please do more and more of it. And so find ways in which we become more like intercessors. And uh, it would be really easy to prove in the life of Jesus that prayer was completely central. Because at his baptism, what was he doing? Praying. Chapter 5, verse 16, often with a challenge, praying. 6, verse 12, praying all night then, to choose the 12. 9, 18, privately with his disciples. And 9, 28, praying at the time of the great confession. And then at the transfiguration, what was he doing? And then in chapter 10, verse 2, he called others to pray for more workers. And then taught them how to pray. And then at 1334, over Jerusalem, he weeps with anguish and prays for it, and then talks about a, pra a parable of prayer, about someone praying to himself. And then with 1940, with tears, and then throwing people out because they'd abused the house of prayer, and then ca calling his disciples to watch and pray if they could to help him for the moment, and then saying to, to Peter just, just before... He's, he's going to let him down. I have prayed for you. And then in Gethsemane, the, the, the anxiety and such was the state of anticipating the cross that blood would come out of his pores praying. And then on the cross itself, Father, forgive them. And then after the resurrection, as he took bread, he was praying. And then when he ascended, what was he doing? Have I proved to you that to him, it was a life bathed wind with more important than air breathing prayer and this is what was happening in the life of the believers when Peter came you see it was a tale of two apostles here's the first witness the one who bears witness to the one who's following that's what a martus is it's not someone who blows himself up and blows other people up it's someone who's prepared to lay their life down just as a follower and many of the people that we work with are counted a great privilege they count that a privilege. It's a badge of honour in Egypt to have a tattoo. Because someone in the family or they themselves know that someone has graciously laid down their lives and they didn't go screaming and kicking because they felt it an honourable thing. That's why their bones were venerated in the early church. Not so sure about that. But here's Peter in, in the Antonio Tower being released one person dies, another person gloriously delivered, no explanation and, 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 and no, apologetic, no apologies. This is the way God has allowed things to work so that his word would go forward. <clears throat> would you like to be one of those apostles? Which one? Okay, moving on real quick. I've got four minutes. The principle of presence witness. And, and what I mean by this is, is God's presence is the thing that we need to covet and, and, and want more than anything. More than our brilliance, more than our accolades, more than our, our uh, ability to, to do this or that. It's God's presence 
that's going to make the difference. Working through you and I, through our weaknesses and through our strengths, He's given you gifts to work through, but it's God's presence. And this is seen directly in Peter's uh, experience. He didn't even know what's happening. Wake up, you pillock. What? Oh, what's happening to these chains? What's going on? The doors are opening. And it isn't until he's hit the, the cool air of the night, he suddenly said, this is really happening. This is really happening. God is at work in such an incredible way. And he has to persuade them. Persuade Peter to see God or indirectly. There's a great um, irony here where the church is praying. Because um, as the church is praying, um, Peter hits the night. He says, I'll nip over to Auntie Mary's place. I know they're always praying over there. So he knocks on the door. It's great. Rhoda comes to the door. It's Peter. No, it can't be. We're still praying. No, it's his angel. There's a deep, deep irony going on there where Luke is saying, as he does in his first volume in the Gospel, is the centrality and importance of Christian prayer is, is, is almost everything. It's, it's, it's the only way of going forward. And I can imagine that some of the homilies in the catacombs was, do you remember when Jesus, this is Peter, speaking to those you know, in the underground catacombs as they would meet possibly, he'd say, you know when Jesus taught, ask and it shall be given to you, seek and you'll find, knock and the door will open. You know, it happened to me. I was knocking on the door. They were all praying. They didn't even believe what they are praying. You can imagine it there, can you? Sorry, a bit of preacher's license there, but I'm sure that sermon will have been preached sometime in the early church because the presence of him being there is the all-important thing. It's the all-important thing. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And even if you're going to work against me, I'm going to do it. So decide whether you want to work with me or against me, even as Christians. That's why it's important to have God's perspective. And so as I come towards the end, the great faithful witness of God's presence is the one who's not only died as a witness, but ever lives as a witness. I don't know if any of us will be called to lay down our lives. I'm not sure... Uh, I want that, frankly. Um, the, the, one of my favourite characters, uh, a Bishop Ignatius in the early church, uh, almost, he wrote seven letters, and in, in, in his letter to the Romans, chapter four it is, actually, he says, I want to be ground like the pure bread of heaven. I want my sinews to be torn by the wild beasts. Now, I'm not quite sure that is quite the right attitude, frankly. <laughs> Um, and if you start getting bishops writing to you that sort of stuff, today it would be a mental health issue. Uh, and we would probably prevent them and, and hide them away or full of, full of drugs or something. Uh, or maybe Ignatius knew that those times of great extremists were the times of most intimate presence of God. Maybe he had learned that. Maybe that's why he desired that. Well, I'm not sure I want to give my life if God doesn't want me to lay it down because that would be disobedience. That would be stupidity. But if he was called to. But what about a life that's lived as a witness? A full life that's lived as a witness? Somehow part of me tells me that day by day, day in, day out, you being called to witness to the one that you are following may even be a higher calling. It may even be a more difficult calling, particularly in the circumstances where you are at this moment. What is it that you need? You need the presence of God, the power of God, the Holy Spirit, to help you. And so I think these principles are here. Quick reminder. Can I play one clip? This, is, this little girl is a rock star in my mind. Barnabas Aid. This is our principles by which we have grown, I think, colossally. These are the things that we distilled our work down into. It's because we love the family, really, and we hope that the family love us. But just listen to her. Sound? Maybe you can click it from there.
another time. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the great gift of, of yourself to us, of your Son to us, of your Spirit to us. And now may we pray that we may give ourselves back to you for your honour and your glory. In Jesus' name, Amen.